welcome back. And um, we're moving on from the Homeric epic to a rather different form of literature, which is that of a tragedy in the ancient Greek um, understanding of genre. There were five great genres of literature. We're going to spend the majority of the course looking at just one genre, the epic, because uh, as I said, the epic uh, is considered the greatest form of literature that uh, simultaneously uh, educates the populace of those that enjoy the epics. And um, I think it's very useful for a comparative study, seeing how uh, from different eras, we're going to, as I say, from the Greeks to the Romans on into the Christian era, see how uh, uh, theological implications transform classical culture. That's part of my um, uh, agenda here is to demonstrate that uh, moving on towards mo the modern era. Um, but I didn't want to think, make you think that the only thing ever written was epics. Uh, especially since the tragedy is, in Aristotle's estimation, the greatest um, and highest form of literature. And so in Aristotle's work called Poetics, he identifies the tragedy as the most serious form of literature, even above the epic, which is interesting and probably not in keeping with the Greek standard view, although Aristotle in general is taken by people to be representative of the, you know, this is what the Greeks thought, if Aristotle suggests it. But he dissents on this point by spending so much time talking about the, about the tragedy. And when he mentions the tragedy, he specifically mentions this one that we're going to study, Oedipus the King, Oedipus Rex, as it's uh, called in Latin, as the best represent representative of the epic genre, or the epic, the tragic uh, form of literature. And so I'm going to spend a little bit of time on the tragedy, uh, its uh, basic features, its uh, different form of presentation. I talked to you about how Homer's uh, epic would have been recounted by a rap soda singer with a, some sort of a lyre or something and would have sung or recounted by memory the entirety of the epic to an audience listening in and delighting in the tale whereas this is presented in what we would call a theater. And an outdoor theater at that, as you can see here, uh, we, uh, we actually call it an amphitheater because it's a, the amphi means around. The theater and the theater, the word theater comes from the Greek verb theatron, which is to view. And the audience, are, audience means hearers, but the audience here are spectators. They're, they're watching what takes place down here on, on the stage. And the amphitheater, as you can, as you might think, is really here, really poor for hearing, or at least you might think so, because outdoor space, the 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 sound goes out. But note that for those that are on the stage, the sound is going this way, and it's going into the steps. You can see it differently here. Uh, no, I got rid of all the other parts presentations of this. But the steps, it was very carefully architecturally designed so that the sound was actually amplified by the amphitheater. And you didn't lose your voice in the sound going outwards because, again, it was going into a, a, a stone facade and the facade preserved the acoustics of it. And there was another device that was involved there, which you could say is a technological device, if you will, that the actors would have had, and that is that they all wore masks. So the distance, let's say you're sitting up here, you can't see the faces of the actors any more than we can in our theatrical, like if you're in the cheap seats up in the gods, you can't see what's going on on stage. And it doesn't matter what's going on stage, on, on stage if the purpose of there, that is not a spectacle, but rather uh, an audience. You're there to hear. And, and, and observe what's going on, and you're not actually caring what's on the faces of the actors. You're more interested in what they're having to say. And what the mask does is it gives, a fix, first of all, a fixed image of what the person looks like and represents. They wear a mask. But the masks also have an acoustic quality, so you can hear when I do that. And so a Greek mask, let's see if I can find something here. Greek tragic 
mask. There you go. Let's see like this. Uh, so this is the comedy and the tragedy. Might be copyrighted, whatever. But it's a fixed thing, but it's got a yeah, nice face, eh? The happy is Bacchus there with the the wine or the uh, the grapes on his forehead. Here's the tragedy, the look of horror. But it's a fixed look. So when we read about Oedipus, his mask would have been a mask of horror right from the beginning of the play. And so if you if you think about that, it takes away a great deal of the um, suspense about what's going to happen. You know that the character that's at the center of the play is going to be visited with horror in his life. It's inevitable. It's fated. It's an outcome. And yet, that doesn't remove the suspense from the story. And it's an old story. The story of Oedipus the king and what he did uh, is a legend in the time of Sophocles, the dramatist here. And it's so ancient and so well known that one of the key characters, Tiresias, we already met in Homer's Odyssey. He was in the underworld. Remember, he was the one Odysseus went to go down to speak to, to find about prophetically about what was going to happen in the future. He went down to consult with Tiresias. Tiresias, the blind prophet, was in uh, Homer's Odyssey in the underworld. And remember, Homer wrote his work, scholars speculate, but something like the 8th century BC about events that took place 400 years before that. By the time Sophocles is writing his work, it's another, let's see, 8th century, another four centuries after that. And yet it's a story that is known by the Greeks already about the horror of what happened in Thebes. It's an ancient tale, and they already know the outcome. So they're not trying to mess with the event. They're not trying to tell a new story. They're trying to tell an ancient story that they still think has a, a permanent relevance to the human condition, which is why we still uh, read this play and why Aristotle says the tragedy is the most important and most serious of all the Greek dramatic forms because he thinks that there's something in the tragedy, tragic form and specifically in the execution of it by Sophocles that warrants our attention. And uh, so just as an entry point into this whole discussion, I think it's interesting to see how the ancient perspective on art is that there are fixed ways of telling things that are the best ways of doing things. And so there's, a, there's a, an art to it, which we should, the rules of which we should adhere to if we want to be a good storyteller. And certain types of it are more conducive to the, the type of story you want to tell. So the epic should use the conventions of the epic. You know, begin with a crisis, right in the middle of things, and then backtrack to the beginning of how we got there and then go forward and so forth. That becomes the structure of an epic. And it goes down the underworld and has the council of the gods and has certain features that are go with an epic and it's telling you everything about everything, pretty much. Whereas a tragedy is dealing with a figure who is caught up in a situation that he wants to avoid at all costs and yet can't avoid because and this goes with the Greek conception of the religious worldview of the Greeks, because they live in a fatalistic universe in which change is impossible. You're, you're destined to a certain outcome, whether you want it or not. And make no mistake, the main character here, the main protagonist, whose name is Oedipus, does everything he can to avoid the thing that he ends up doing. And Aristotle thinks that this is characteristic of the human condition because we're also fated to a certain outcome in life that we can't avoid because Aristotle assumes that the fates govern life. Now, let me say a bit about the fates. Do you know anything about the fates? You've heard the word fates. You've heard of fatalistic. You've heard it sounds ominous. It, it has a specific meaning for the Greeks. There are three fates one of which uh, your life is presented like a cord 
one of which grabs the cord and pulls it, the second of which measures the extent of your life, and the third of which cuts the cord. Those three fates. And every human life is fated in that sense by these three goddesses that control every human life. And because of that, there is no way in which you can, uh, you can change what is fated. Even the gods, we saw this last time, in Homer's Odyssey, when I say the gods, I'm talking about the Olympian gods, Zeus, Apollo, uh, Athena, they can't change what is fated. So in that sense, the gods are not like a Christian sense of God, where God is outside space and time, and he is all powerful, and he can see things before they've happened, and he can actually intervene in human history and transform things utterly at any point. He's above there. God is not fated to do anything. His being is not conditioned in that way. Whereas the Olympian gods can't do anything that's not already fated. So they're less powerful than the fates. You got to remember that here. The fates, and that's the Greek religious conception of life, is that everything is fated to be a certain way and you cannot change it. You're done. And that has a powerful effect on the way you look at yourself and you look at the world and you look at other people, because if you're fated to be a certain way, then you may, you're just stuck to it, you're resigned to that. And a lot of the world's religions are fatalistic in this sense. So for example, in Eastern religions, let's say in Hinduism, they have a caste system in which you are, you are born into a certain strata social uh, aspect of life, and you are either a lower or an upper caste or anything in the middle, but you can't change that by anything that you do. You're, that's what you're fated to be, and you can't move that. And if you know that you can't move it, you don't try and change your conditions. Why would you bother? And furthermore, since that's your identity, why would you think of doing anything different? And what do you, would anyone care that you were the way that you were? Do, do the gods care about the fact that you're born into this caste? Does anyone care? In the Hindu system, uh, system, there are millions of gods. I mean, as many gods as you can think of, there are gods for that. But they don't care the fact that you're born into this particular caste because you and the gods have nothing in common. In a Christian conception, we bear the image of God. And so God is interested in what happens to human beings. In the Greek conception, the gods are interested in some of the people, but in particular those that are demigods and share some of their na some of their nature, like Odysseus. Right? He's got a father who's one of the gods, and his mother is a, a mortal, and so he's going to die as well. But the gods are interested because of that, and also because of what he does. So they're interested in some people, but the majority of people are not in of interest to the Greek gods. Those that, to some degree, bear the image of God, like Odysseus, they're interested in him. And in the Greek uh, and actually the whole ancient Near Eastern world, the kings are said to bear the image of God. Like Pharaoh, he's presented as a god. In Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar is one of the gods, and he's re he requires you to worship him and, and do what he's, not just do what he says, but to worship him as a god. Creates huge conflict when uh, God's people Israel come in contact with these cultures. But this is one of those cultures. The Greeks have one of those cultures. And for them, we are required to worship the gods because they are the gods. But even the gods themselves can't change what is fated. Is that helpful? It's a very different way of looking at things than I think we're accustomed to in our world where most people don't even think that there are gods or that, and certainly don't think that we can know them. And certainly don't think that our life is ruled by anything like what I've just suggested, although most people will talk about fate or karma all the time, which is a term that suggests a meaningless, inescapable, purposeless existence about which nobody cares. Like, and I am including Christians in this. Most people have not thought through the implications of what it means to bear the image of God and have God care for you. It means that things are not fated. Things don't happen by random chance. Your, your destiny is not doomed. Redemption's always possible. 
and, and it, God intervenes in history. That changes everything. And he, not just that he could, but that he did. It's a historical event. This takes place centuries before that, but still the conception is there, useful, and the Greeks call it a tragedy. And we still have the sense of a tragedy. Let me say something about what a tragedy uh, might mean. Um, this is a little bit speculative, but this is commonly thought view that I'm going to hold here, that the early beginnings of a tragedy were something like, is this it? This is it. Um, that tragedy began with um, people wearing with the dance of satyrs. And, and it's like a goat, a tragedy is a goat song. The word Audi is a song. And the tragos, a goat. It's a goat song. And, they, and the actors would wear something like boots on stage, like a goat's hooves. And there would be a, and you'd, you'd hear the, 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 the boots of the actors clopping on the stage where comedy they wore soft soled shoes. And, but, but, the early origins of this are uh, dedicated to a particular god, namely the god of Dionysus. So Greek theater is a religious performance, I want to add as well. Just like we can see in the epic, there's a, uh, we, he's, they're paying homage to the Olympian gods in that, and Homer is actually invoking the muse, who's divine, to tell the story about the gods and how to live a godly life. In the same way, the tragedy begins dedicated to a particular god, and the particular god is Dionysus. And the story of Dionysus is that he is one of the, guards, the gods of the harvest, associated with wine and associated with certain rituals. There's an ecstatic uh, ritual in which god, the god Dionysus is torn apart by the Bacantes, his followers. Lots of sexual initiation involved with his orgies and so forth. But, but back, Bacchus is torn apart and reconstituted. He comes back to life. And so some, uh, in terms of Christian history, Bacchus is often seen as a type of Christ because he dies and is born again. But that's not the Greek conception. The Greek conception associates him, though, with, with revelry and also with violence and associated with the tragedy is always violence on stage. And it makes Bacchus happy to see the violence. It's part of the expression of the worship of Bacchus that you will commit violence and gratuitous sexual and to some degree illicit sexual actions will take place. So the uh, seat of uh, Sophocles, Oedipus the King, is about incest, which is taboo in every culture interfamilial sexual relations that the gods frown upon and yet it happens and the gods are going to punish you for the fact that it happens. And the most famous instance of which is this one here. But it's a goat song, uh, probably separate from the chorus, and the chorus has a certain function with it. So I've got a timeline here behind me. You can have a look at this if you want. But um, the time of Greek drama is in the 5th century uh, BC. The great era of, of Athenian drama, and there are three Athenian dramatists that we associate with this. This is one of them, Sophocles. The first is uh, Euripides, uh, the second Aeschylus in terms of birth, and the third Sophocles, and they develop the genre as it goes by. Uh, at first, in Aeschylus's uh, rendition, there are only two actors on the stage, Eventually, three actors get brought in. So it's a, de it's a developing genre. Let me say something else about this. The drama that is performed is performed in, uh, in a cycle or a sequence. So you'll notice here, this is Oedipus the King. This is part one of the tragedy of Oedipus. The second is Oedipus at Colonus, and the third is Antigone. And that is the way these uh, performances were presented to the audience, they would pre be presented as a, a competition. Different dramatists would put on their play cycles, and as I say, in sequences of three, like a trilogy, <coughs> and then they would be judged by, by the judges, and one of them would be awarded a prize for which was the best performance. 
And it wasn't really about the actors, it was about the playwright. Because as I say, the actors are wearing masks. All the actors have to do is know their lines and speak clearly and articulately. But it's really about the playwright and what the playwright writes. And the story that the playwright writes, as I said to you, is not a new story. So what makes Sophocles the great tragedian is the way in which he tells an already known story to his audience. That's what Aristotle is praising him for. It's not what you tell, it's how you're telling what we already know. And the meaning of the way in which you've told it, that's what he says is so great about Sophocles. And you can see there's a whole series of these things, but they take place in, in a very important time in Athenian history. And it's right before the trial and death of Socrates. So Athenian drama, so we have, in terms of Greek culture, we have the epic, which is, as I say, the, the teacher of all the Greeks. We have a period of Athenian drama when, when Athens is warring against Sparta and both against the Persians and so forth. And then we get the period of, of the Greek philosophers, which we associate with Socrates and Plato and Aristotle. And then, and then we get Alexander the Great, who comes along, Aristotle's greatest pupil and the spread of Greek culture throughout the whole known world. And, but this precedes that. And it's, as I say, it's a festival dedicated to the god Dionysus. And um, that all, all of the tragedies are dedicated to Dionysus. And so there's something about Dionysus which needs to be connected to the entirety of the epic, and we need to know something about Dionysus. Oh, by the way, if you, has ever, everyone's heard of Dionysus? I hadn't when I was your age, but I hadn't read C.S. Lewis. Like the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe has Dionysus. And you think, what, the, what on earth is he doing here in the middle? And Father Christmas as well. Like, why is he like the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe? How come Father Christmas is here and then Dionysus appears? Like, what's with that? Again, it's these are associated with Christianity in various ways. Lewis is just chucking them in there uh, rather randomly, um, which he gets criticized for by Tolkien. Um, but the tragedy, Aristotle says, has certain features that make it powerful and necessary. And he says it's necessary in a tragedy to have a tragic hero. Do you want to comment before I go on? Same guy. Bacchus and Dionysus are the same. One and the same. And as I say, the followers of Dionysus are called the Bacchantes. B-A-C-C-H-A-N-T-E-S. Followers of Bacchus. And they are presented, it, it, they're called the Maenads as well, the Bacchantes. And they, they are presented as being drunk, uh, sexually lewd, and they grab, and it's just, it's brutal. Orgiastic rich, rituals, basically. So it's got something to do with some sort of a sexual rite as well. But it's all, it's rather complicated here because now it's associated with something that's prohibited sexually as well. Anyway, the tragic hero uh, is one of the things that Aristotle says is essential to a tragedy. What is his characteristic? Well, for Aristotle, says that he needs to be a man who's better than we are. A tragic hero cannot be somebody that we look down on. Ignore the fact that Oedipus commits incest. He's, because we would look down on that. We said that's a degrading thing. But that's not how we first see him. We will know that eventually he does that and we'll say, what a horrible act. And we will want nothing to do with that. We'll, we'll want to throw him out of the camp. Say, we cannot associate with that at all. He has to be driven off the stage. Terrible. What we first know about Oedipus is that he's a noble man. In fact, he, he eventually becomes a king. He's of noble blood. So he's a, he, And Aristotle says he has to be somebody who we naturally look up to in terms of his station in life. He's, he has wealth. He has privilege. He has power. He has a standing. And we admire him. And it's necessary for a tragedy that the hero be admirable first. Because otherwise, we don't feel the effect of what 
is going to happen, which is that he's going to fall far below us. But what happens to the great tragic hero, Aristotle says is true of the human condition in general. We aspire to be as gods, to immortality, and yet we always fall. So in that sense, I think Homer, or rather Aristotle thinks, this is, says something true about the human condition, not just about that man. <coughs> so in that sense, it's, it's didactic. It's teaching us something about human nature and the Greek view of human nature. So note that the Greek view of human nature does entail greatness, but also contains a sense of a, a failing, a, an, a lack in human nature that Aristotle thinks is a fatal flaw. And it leads us to certain transgressions and so forth. All of this without a Christian doctrine of, of sin. But still, there's an absence here. So the tragic hero, once again, has a, a greater nature than we do, and yet he makes a mistake characteristic of humanity, and he falls prey of, to forces that he cannot control. And in fact, by trying to avoid them, he actually brings them about. But that's because, again, of the fatalistic character of life. And he does so through what Aristotle, and this is really interesting, calls a uh, hamartia, which is a mistake. Let me write this down. H-A-M-A-R-T-I-A, -A -A, hamartia. Uh, a word that we get from archery. It means to miss the mark. In archery, you're trying to hit the bullseye, pull back the bow, shoot the arrow, and you don't, not only do you not hit the bullseye, you miss the target entirely. That's a hamartia. You miss the mark. It's one of the four words used in the New Testament for sin. Isn't that interesting? And the study of sin in the realm of theology is called hamartology. As I say, there are four words used in the New Testament for sin, but this is one of them. It's just not doing what your purpose to do, what you were created for. God created us to adore him, to worship him, to obey him. We do, as characteristic of human nature, we're subject to original sin. The sin of Adam means we always miss the mark. We don't do what we were created to do, and thereby guilty for it. There are other aspects of sin, but this is one of them. <coughs> now, in Aristotle's reckoning, there's no um, moral failing that comes from that per se it's like being mortal we want to be like the gods and live forever but because of human nature we miss that mark we can never hit it it's always failing all human beings die with the exception of the epic hero and with the exception of those that bear the image of god the leaders they become like stars they become gods but the rest of us no chance. But Aristotle applies this to the audience, and so he's moving us in the direction, I think, towards a more Christian theology. Not that he has any sense of that, but already by saying that the audience responds to this portrait of a special human being who bears the image of the gods and, and commits this fatal flaw, he says it applies to us in a sense. He's leaning us into the direction which he probably doesn't understand even himself, but in, probably intuits, that the audience responds to this because we do share something in common even with the leading, the ruling class. But he commits this um, tragic flaw, and he does it in character with his origins. So I'll, I'll get into his origins in a, in a second here, but let me put a nice picture behind me here. Um, he does this in the Oedipus the King, Oedipus Rex, however you want to present it, in conjunction with what his parents did wrong. And what his parents did wrong was to insult the gods. How did they insult the gods? They were told that their child 
their son would murder their father, murder his father and marry his mother. And they said, we don't want that to happen and we can make that problem go away. We can prevent what is fated. And so then they seek to try to do that. Now, is that insulting the gods? No, it's trying to avoid, we wouldn't see it that way. They're trying to avoid a terrible consequence for themselves. And so what they do is the child is born and what they then do is they, they give this baby who's Oedipus away to a herdsman and say to him, him, you go put the child in the wilderness and leave it where the wild animals will eat the child. Very common practice in the ancient world. And, that, and, and in places like Rome, or the cities, of when you had a child you didn't want, you took it to a place where the wild animals would be gathered or the dogs. And the dogs would know that's where people leave food. There's a baby, I don't want that baby. We don't go to an abortion clinic. We take it to the place where the dogs know food's coming every on a regular basis. And in this case, go take him into the wilderness and let the wild animals take care of him. The, hunt, the herdsman takes pity on the baby and gives it to another herdsman. This obeys the orders. And then that herdsman takes the baby to another country, another city rather, and it just so happens that the king and queen of that city lack a child and then they raise the baby up as their own, not telling him that he's not their son. So he's brought up as a Corinthian, even though he was born in Thebes. And then while he's in Corinth, somebody tells him, you know what? You're not who you think you are. You're a bastard. You're not, you're not the son. You're not the legitimate heir of the king and queen of Corinth. You're this. And he gets so angry about it that he consults with the oracle of Delphi. Because the Delphic Oracle is, by the way, this is Delphi in the picture behind me. Consult with the famous Oracle at Delphi, mentioned in Acts, by the way, the Pythoness, the priestess of the, uh, that would have uh, served the Oracle at Delphi, and consults with the Oracle, who also speaks to Socrates, by the way, uh, and asks the Delphic Oracle whether it was true And the oracle reveals to him that it is true that it's not. And that he was going to murder his father and marry his mother. And so he decides, I'm going to stop that from happening. And I'm going to go this way towards Delphi. Not Delphi, towards uh, Thebes, where he was born. And on the road, he meets a man, an old man who's in a big carriage, and says, you're, on, you're, on, you're in my way on the road, get out of my way. And this young man decides to give the old man, the mouthy old guy in the carriage, a little bit of a lesson, and he whacks him. Or actually, the old man whacks him in the head, first of all, with a, with a staff, bites into the back of his head, and then he punches him so hard that he falls out of his carriage and dies. Now that man who falls of the carriage and dies, is actually his father. And then he carries on on the road. He has no idea who this is. He carries on on the road towards Thebes and discovers that Thebes has lost its king. And the whole city is in turmoil over it. And they're also suffering all sorts of crises, and one is that they're being persecuted by a sphinx. Anyway, there's a whole, whole series of things, but eventually he goes there and finds there's a queen that doesn't have a king, and she looks pretty good, actually. There's something about you that seems oddly familiar, and, and they have children. And of course, now the prophecy's been fulfilled. He doesn't know it. So when we, we pick up Oedipus, it's right in the middle of that story. Now, all those things have already happened. Everything I just said to you, as it's, 
And so the, the structure of the, tra the epic is a lot like the tragedy. We begin in the middle of the crisis. That's how it begins. He's already murdered his father. He's already married his mother. He's already had children from his mother. He's committed the incest, all the horrible things that everyone would have sought to avoid. He's already done those things. So you think the story's all over at that point. We know what's going to happen. We know what has happened. That's the beginning of the tragedy because the horror of it is that he has no idea what he's done. And the city is furthermore being persecuted and destroyed by Apollo because of the, the scandal of incest that the locals have not punished and furthermore that their king has been murdered and nobody's found the murderer. So huge injustice has been committed. Disgusting all around and the pollution from this is destroying the city. And so Apollo demands justice to be done. Find the murderer of the king and take care of the problem of incest in the midst of this city. And the city of Thebes is infamous for this, historically, for this ancient act, whenever it occurred. But it's obviously before the story of Homer, so it's, it's ancient history. But as I say, the story is already, so it's just like the epic in the sense that it begins in a crisis and then it backtracks. And what we do in this though is unlike the epic, the main hero has no idea who has caused this problem. Whereas Odysseus knows. We might not know as the audience how he got to this point. He's gonna tell us his story. In this case, it's the main figure of Oedipus who does not know who he, am, who he is. And one of the great features of this uh, epic is that his name is a play on words. So the word Oedipus uh, My wife gets really angry when I use my sleeve to wipe this off, so I won't do that. Um, it sounds a lot like the Greek Oidapu, which means oida is from to know, and pu will then be what do I know? Oedipus doesn't know who he is. His play, his words a play on this. Oida means I see, I know. Actually, the first translation of oida is I, I see. Second is I know. Oedipus claims to be an all-seeing prophet who knows who he is and is famous for having defeated the Delphic Oracle. He solves the Delphic Oracle's riddle. That's also ancient history. That's happened before the play. The reason why he's in this position is he saved the city of Thebes and married the queen. And the people of Thebes regard him as their savior because of his prophetic insight. He solved the, the, the riddle of the Delphic Oracle, which was destroying them. And the riddle of the Delphic Oracle is what? What walks on four legs in the morning, two legs at noon, and three days in the evening? And nobody knows the answer to the riddle, and so the Delphic Oracle is just, or rather the uh, Sphinx is destroying the city. Oedipus knows the answer. The answer is a man. Crawls like a baby in the morning, in the noonday of his life, walks on two legs. On the, on, in the evening, he's on three because he has a cane. This will be the story of Oedipus's life. The baby who becomes the man who eventually leaves the play with a cane, walking around blinded off the stage. So the story of Oedipus the king is about human nature. You see how clever this all is at this point. He's not just talking about the story of Oedipus, he's talking about humanity, which again walks like a, on four and two and three, because all of us move as we get older into the position of the three legs. They don't have wheelchairs or anything like that, but they're talking about the progression of human life towards mortality. So it's about human nature again, I say. And Oedipus particularly represents this in his particular story that uh, Sophocles so brilliantly weaves into a tragic tale about 
human life, not just this human life. And what Aristotle is suggesting to us is that we don't know who we are. Even though we think we know who we are, we don't really. We can't solve the riddle who, of who we are. And Oedipus, and this is the great irony, and that I need to talk about irony now, the audience knows who Oedipus is long before Oedipus does. He's the last person to figure out who he is. So the audience, so there's a discrepant awareness. The audience knows that this man is the horrible Oedipus. How do they know? Well, he's wearing the stupid mask. Horror is written on his face from the beginning. We know that this man is the uh, committed in an atrocity and suffers abominably for it. He's a tragic figure. He wears the mask, but he doesn't know who he is. He presents himself as something when actually he's the exact opposite of it. Again, Aristotle says this, this is true of human nature. Isn't that interesting? Yes, comment or question. Yes, but, it's, but Aristotle says that this tragedy is the best at conveying it. But yes, there's often a dramatic irony that the characters on stage say and do things the audience knows more than they do. And that's interesting. And now that can only work if the story is already well known. So it's not interesting. I don't need to invent a new tale that you've never, like our, in our day we want to tell stories that have never been told before. We meet a new character, new name, you know, his name is what? Jason Bourne, his name is whatever, Peter Parker. And then they'll tell a story and we don't know where the story is going. We have no idea. It's a twist and so we have to watch to the end to find out. That's not how the Greeks tell stories. They tell you stories about things that are well known already and from that they talk about something that you're not aware of, namely your own human nature. You seem oblivious. So it becomes a very philosophical exploration then. And that's why Aristotle says that the tragedy is the most philosophic and serious of all literary forms because it says something about us. In a way, it's not just entertainment, in other words. And you can see the difference between the Greek conception of theater and what we do. We go for entertainment. Eat the popcorn, drink the drinks. Oh, this is a great, you know, I was, yeah. Was it, oh, it was a great show. Okay. Did it teach you anything about yourself? Did it teach you about life? Did it teach you about to question profound philosophical matters related to human identity in general? The, the Greeks did. So again, we associate ancient Greece with the philosophers these days. For right, for good reason. But that philosophic mindset comes from the poets. That's where it comes from. They're already aware and exploring this, and they do it in their dramatic and artistic portraits. Very rare in our day for even those themes to be touched on. Here it's central to the whole uh, drama. Central. So I said, Oidapu, oh, I should translate, right? This is obviously then O-I-D-A-P-O-U, question mark. Who am I? Another rendition of Oedipus is swollen foot. The poo then is the uh, foot. Anoida sounds, sounds like, again, we're talking about sounds, possible derivations for this is, a, is swollen foot. And that comes from Oedipus's own background when he was, uh, when his uh, mother and father ordered him to be killed, they put a some sort of a needle or whatever through his through his ankles, and so he walks with a limp. Now, where'd you get the limp from? No idea. Well, I'll tell you where you got the limp from. From when you were born, you were supposed to die. You were strung up and you carried you around through this, you know, this through your ankles as a little child limp in the rest of your life. Again, Aristotle is going to see this as, in some ways, true of all of us. We're born with a limp. It's called mortality. So, Sophocles takes a story which is well known and structures it as a work of art. So, a work of art is more than telling a story. It's the way you tell the story, and the way you tell your story is to make it philosophically serious. 
and theologically serious for that matter. And he will, it will, he will include words that become, come into, if you do literary theory with me in fourth year, uh, I will look at the tragedy and all Aristotle says about it, but he says that the author or the tragic hero also possesses what we call hubris, a word we still use in English. A f he's arrogant. He doesn't think, he thinks that he can defy the gods. Oh, I can avoid that outcome. It's a hubris. Nobody can evade the will of the gods. And that's why the gods are angry. It's not just because of what he did, it's because they, he thought and his parents thought in their huge pride that the fates could be avoided when the Olympian gods themselves can't even circumvent fate. Even they don't have the power to do this. So that's how it begins. Any comments or questions before I actually get into this here? But I want to show you one final thing before we move on. This is the structure of the ancient Greek theater. <clears throat> As I say, from the, a different perspective. So before it was looking that way down, we'll just flip it around and put that which is there and was here. And now we have things that are associated with theater to this day. The, the words that are there from the Greek theater have carried on into contemporary theater. So one of them is calling it a theater. But this is the scene, the skene. The orchestra is down here in the pit. They have an orchestra playing. And there's an altar because, remember, it's dedicated to Dionysus here. And the actors are going here, and the parody and the parasena, and this is where the, the, the speeches happen, front stage. Uh, there's a priest of Dionysus stuck front and center because, again, it's dedicated to Dionysus, the whole festival. And all sorts of, but this is the theater. And there are spectators, and they're there to see something, but they're more, it's, it's the spectacle is actually the least important part of the tragedy. It's not a visual spectacle, it's an auditory spectacle. You go there to hear the tragedy. And it's so important. Uh, and such a strong emphasis that when it comes to the most visually arresting part of the whole tragedy, Oedipus goes off stage. He leaves the stage, goes off, and comes back on with a different mask. And when he comes back, it's because his eyes get gouged out, and he comes back with blood on the mask. Because he's just gouged his eyes out. When he hears the truth of who he is, he does not want to see anything because it's just a horror he looks around he sees his mother he sees his children all of which remind him of what a horror he is he can't even look at himself takes his own digs his own eyes out now he doesn't dig his eyes out on stage the greeks thought that 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 sort of uh visual depiction demeaned the audience they don't have to see it they know what's happened that's enough Remember, the Greeks live in a, a very violent world. They see killing and so forth, but they think that watching it is in some ways demeaning to the audience. It has a moral effect. We can take too much delight in it. They've observed how people like watching blood sports. Happens all the time. That's not what they, they don't want. We don't want you to get distracted with blood sports here. We're going to talk about something far more important than something violent and sexually promiscuous and transgressive is going on. We're going to talk about the human condition. Let's not make this into... Uh, even though it's dedicated to Dionysus, we're going to talk about the philosophical significance of this. And if you just see gratuitous violence on the stage, you'll get distracted by that. So they go off stage. He comes back on stage with the deed done, and it's clear that he's taken his eyes out. Only then. And then as the play concludes, the city of Thebes cast him out like a scapegoat. Like a scapegoat, he bears the sins of the city in himself. And if you want to make parallels to the Christian story, you can talk about Christ having that same sort of role of a scapegoat. The sins of the city, the sins of humanity, the tragic flaws of humanity represented by Oedipus, he bears them and he walks out as if he were uniquely 
guilty of those things, which in the, in the play he is, but again, he represents human nature. So in a sense, we all deserve that sort of treatment. Anyway, that's the theater. Let me go to the play itself. So I'm just going to read this here. I'm not going to put it up online. I'll just read the first few. So any comments or questions before I do proceed? All right, well, let me do that then. Um, as I say, in the prologue, and if you read it, it says, scene. Now, here's the scene, and we get acts and scenes from plays, but the scene is a reference to the what's going on on stage. We talk about scenery now and so forth, but the scene there is actually a reference to the stage itself. And the scene in front of the palace of Oedipus at Thebes, to the right of the stage, near the altar, stands the priest with a crowd of children. Oedipus, Oedipus emerges from the central door. Oedipus. Children, young sons and daughters of old Cadmus. I'll come to that in a sec. Why do you sit here with your suppliant crowns? The town is heavy with a mingled burden of sounds and smells, of groans and hymns and incense. I did not think it fit that I should hear of this from messengers, but came myself. I, Oedipus, whom all men call the Great, turns to the priest. You're old and they are young. Come, speak for them. What do you fear or want that you sit here suppliant? Indeed, I'm willing to give all that you may need. I would be very hard should I not pity suppliants like these. So Cena said at the beginning, we have the great, we have Oedipus the Great. He's called great. It's not just that he's the king. He is the king who has saved the city. We're going to find out about what he saved them from. I've already given it away. It's the riddle of the Sphinx. But he's not just any king. He is a great king. The city loves him. The hero. But old man, what, priest, what do you say on behalf of the children, as he calls them? And he'll call them his own children. By the way, the orchestra takes place here. It would be those uh, singers and so forth. Um, and, uh, and there'll be a chorus that will join them. The chorus will represent the, the common people in this. So it's a, it's a portrait of civic life on stage. Just like uh, the uh, epic, I said, was about the Oedi Odysseus, and his family, but actually it was also about the whole city that he represented, or the nation of Ithaca, and it had cosmological significance. Same thing with the tragedy. This isn't just a story of a man, it's a story that involves the whole city, the whole demos, the whole population interested in civilization, and also involves the gods. So full, three levels, individual, civic, cosmological. Same here. Priest, what does the priest say? O ruler of my country, Oedipus, you see our enemy around the altar. You see our ages. Some of us, like these, who cannot yet fly far. And some of us, heavy with age. These children are the chosen among the young, and I the priest of Zeus. Within the marketplace sit others crowned with suppliant garlands at the double shrine of Pallas, that is Athena, and the temple where Ismenus gave oracles by fire. King, you yourself have seen our city reeling like a wreck already. It can scarcely lift its prow out of the depths, out of the bloody surf. A blight is on the fruitful plants of the earth. A blight is on the cattle in the fields. A blight is on our women that no children are born to them. A god that carries fire, a deadly pestilence is on our town strikes us and spares not, and the house of Cadmus is emptied of its people while black death grows rich in groaning and in lamentation. So there's the scene. The city is being assailed in various ways. People are dying. Children are not being born. The gods are clearly cursing the city. Opening scene. So then he moves on, line 31. We have not come as suppliants to this altar because we thought of you as of a god, but rather judging you the first of men in all the chances of this life 
and when we mortals have to do with more than man. You came and by your coming saved our city, freed us from the tribute which we paid of old to the Sphinx, cruel singer. This you did in virtue of no knowledge we could give you, in virtue of no teaching. It was God that aided you, men say, and you are held with God's assistance to have saved our lives. So as I say, he's regarded as a savior in the city. Now, Oedipus, greatest in all men's eyes, here, falling at your feet, we all entreat you. Find us some strength for rescue. Perhaps you'll hear a wise word from some god. Perhaps you will learn something from a man. For I have seen that for the skillful, skill to practice the outcome of the councils, live the most. Noblest of men, go and raise up our city. Go and give heed. For now this land of ours calls you its savior, since you have saved it once. So, let us never speak about your reign as of a time when first our feet were set secure on high, but later fell to ruin. Raise up our city. Save it and raise it up. Once you've brought us luck with happy omen, be no less now in fortune. If you will rule this land as now you rule it, Better to rule it full of men than empty. For neither tower nor ship is anything when empty, and none live in it together. Oedipus, I pity you children. You've come full of longing, but I have known the story before you told it. Note that Oedipus is a proud man. I've known the story before you told it only too well. I know you are all sick, yet there is not one of you, sick though you are, that is as sick as I myself. Now the audience, remember, already knows that Oedipus is the famous figure who's committed incest, so he's sick in a sense that they're not. They, he's committed the atrocious crime of incest, but he, he doesn't know it. So when he says, I know that you're sick, he's talking about their physical illnesses, and then he's saying, I feel sick at your sickness. That's what he means by it. There's a third sense of sickness that he's, a, he's morally reprehensible. And the audience is aware of what Oedipus says, and Oedipus himself has no idea. He's just being sympathetic. He's relating to them. None of you are as sick as myself. So there's the irony. The audience knows that he's more sick than he himself knows. So the man who thinks and is famous for seeing is the most blind of everyone, and he's still got his eyes. So your several sorrows each have single scope and touch, but one of you, my spirit groans for city and myself and you at once. You have not roused me like a man from sleep. Know that I have given away many tears to this, gone many ways wandering in thought. But as I thought, I found only one remedy and that I took. I sent Manasseus' son, Creon, Jocasta's brother, his, his wife's brother, his, uh, without knowing, it's actually his uncle, but he doesn't know that. He sent his wife's brother, Creon, to Apollo, to his Pythian temple. Now, Pythian, the Pythian temple is here at Delphi. The Delphic or oracle is devoted to Apollo, the god of the sun. Apollo in Greek means to destroy. He sent it to the, to the god of the destroyer and asked the, for the, the Delphic oracle to reveal to them the, the mystery of who's actually destroying them. Why are the gods angry at this city? He sent Jocasta's brother Creon to find out that he might learn there by what act or word I could save this city. As I count the days, it vexes me what ails him. He's gone far longer than he needed for the journey. But when he comes, then may I prove a villain if I shall not do all the gods command. Again, heavy irony. May I prove a villain <laughs> if, I do not, if I do not do all the god commands. He's already done everything God forbade, but told was going to happen. 
So again, we're sitting there, and the irony is there. Now, the irony is not occasional. It's throughout the entire play. We see everything. The man who claims to see and is revered for seeing and is seen as a savior sees nothing. Priest, thanks for your gracious words. Your servants here signal that Creon is this moment coming. So again, we get the sense in the right beginning, right in the middle, all sorts of stuff has happened before the story even begins, and we're caught right in the middle of it, and he starts catching, uh, catching us up on what's happened before this. So Creon has already been sent away to solve the problem. Now he's coming back. Okay, well, now the story will begin. Oedipus, his face is bright. Oh, holy Lord Apollo, grant that his news too may be bright for us and bring us safety. Priest, it is happy news, I think, for else his head would not be crowned with sprigs of fruitful laurel. Oedipus, we will know soon he's within hail. Lord Creon, my good brother, what is the word you bring us from the god? Creon entered, my good brother. <laughs> Again, everything has a double sense here. Creon enters. A good word for things hard to bear themselves is in the final issue. All is well. I count complete good fortune. What do you mean, says Oedipus? What you have said so far leaves me uncertain whether to trust or fear. Creon, if you will hear my news before these others, I am ready to speak, or else to go within. Speak it to all. The grief I bear, I bear it more for these than for my own heart. I will tell you then what I heard from the god. King Phoebus, that is Apollo, in plain words commanded us, to drive out a pollution from our land. The word pollution in Greek is miasma, a sickness, it's a pollution. Drive out the miasma from our land. Pollution grown ingrained within the land. Drive it out, said the god, not cherish it till it's past cure. Oedipus, what is the right of purification? How shall it be done? Creon, by banishing a man or expiation of blood by blood. So you can either do two things. In, uh, on the Day of Atonement on Yom Kippur, every year there's a ritual performed. You know this in the Hebrew scriptures. There are two animals. There's one which is sacrificed, expiation, blood for blood. You sacrifice the animal, chop it up, and so forth. There's a second animal that they lay, the priest, high priest lays his hands upon, that's the scapegoat, and he gets driven out into the wilderness. You can do either or here. You not think that the uh, there's an overlap between Old Testament narrative and this? There plainly is some sense here. Some sense. But send him out or take his life, since it is murder guilt which holds our city in this destroying storm. Okay. So who is this man whose fate the God pronounces? Creon, my lord, before you piloted the state, we had a king named Laius. I know of him by hearsay. I have not seen him. Not true, but he didn't know that he'd seen him. Creon, the God commanded clearly, let someone punish with force this dead man's murderers. Or Oedipus, where are they in the world? Where would a trace of this old crime be found? Remember, old because he has subsequently married the queen and had children who are now not babies. They're presented as older. So a decade at least has passed from this time. This is an old crime. How am I going to find the criminals that committed this act of murder? It would be hard to guess where. Creon, the clue is in this land. That which is sought is found. The unheeded thing escapes. So said the god. Oedipus, was it at home or in the country that death came upon him? Or in another country, traveling? Refer referring to Laius now, the king. He went, he set himself upon an embassy, but never returned when he set out from home. Was there no messenger, no fellow traveler to know what happened? Such a one might tell something of use. They were all killed. 
save one. He fled in terror, and he could tell us nothing in clear terms of what he knew. Nothing, but one thing only. What was it? If we could even find a slim beginning in which to hope, we might discover much. So now it's CSI. We're going to find the crime. We're going to get the depiction of the crime scene. We're going to figure out who the murderer is on the basis of the slim evidence. Okay, let's start there. And we have, we have the in investigator Oedipus now that's going to figure out based on the evidence in front of us. And we're going to recover the scene of the crime and all that based on eyewitnesses. And then we'll finally figure out who this was. Okay, so we at least got that. This man said that the robbers they encountered were many, and the hands that did the murder were many. It was no man's single power. How could a robber dare a deed like this were he not helped with money from the city? Money and treachery? Good question. Can you imagine a king's been murdered on the road? Surely somebody ordered this murder, and surely it's somebody who has political interest in deposing the king. So it's not just a, a single man. There must be, of course, a group. And that was the testimony. Creon, that indeed was thought. But Laius was dead, and in our trouble there was none to help. Oedipus, the, who's now the king, the, what trouble was so great to hinder you inquiring out the murder of your king? Creon, the riddling sphinx, induced us to neglect mysterious crimes and rather seek solution of troubles at our feet. Now the Sphinx is a mythological beast who has been sent by the gods not just to destroy them but to deceive them, to allow the, the crime which has not been fully completed to be completed. Because he they can't arrest the murderer before he's committed the second part of the crime which is to marry his mother and have children with her. That has not yet happened. So the gods actually send the Sphinx not just to curse the city, but to prevent the city from finding out who the murderer is. So, and the Sphinx induced us to neglect mysterious crimes. crimes. Oedipus, I will bring this to light again. King Phoebus, Apollo, fittingly took this care about the, deed, the dead, and you too, fittingly, and justly you will see in me an ally, a champion of my country and the God. For when I drive pollution from the land, I will not serve a distant friend's advantage, but act in my own interest. <laughs> he says, I'm going to take personal interest in making sure that this is taken care of. But the, there's a secondary sense here, which is the ironic and real sense. It's not going to be acting on a, another party. He's going to do it on his own behalf. Well, he's going to do it to himself. And the, the audience knows that already. As I say, this, the story of Oedipus is well known. So whoever he was that killed the king may readily wish to dispatch me with this murderous hand. His murderous hand. So helping the dead king, I help myself. Now turns, come, suppliant children, take your suppliant bows and go. Up from the altars now. Call the assembly and let it meet upon the understanding that I'll do everything. God will decide whether we prosper or remain in sorrow. And the priest, rise, children, it was this we came to seek, which of himself the king now offers us. May Phoebus, who gave us the oracle, come to our rescue and stay the play. Now, up to this point, we're just getting the unraveling. Of, we're, we're setting the stage for the whole play. And the plot will move in motion. But note how in a very few words, he has pulled us right into the middle of the story and uh, presented himself as the man who's going to solve the crime when, of course, he's committed the crime. And not only is he going to solve the, cr the, the crime, even though he's committed the crime, he's going to be the judge and the jury and the executioner of the crime that's been committed. All those things are going to happen. He's going to have to judge himself, and he's going to have to bear the punishment himself. And he's going to, the city which now hails him as a god and as their savior is going to drive him out of their midst as the scapegoat for all that they've done. And he will himself pluck out his eyes. But note that this is all set right at the outset of the play. So it's not one of those stories, although if you and I saw it, maybe for the first time and didn't know the story of Oedipus, it might be a new story for us. It's not new for the Greeks. I, I repeat 
my emphasis on that. Very important. The stories that most are most worthy of being told are the stories that have been told again and again and again and again. This is why on the course, we're looking at great works of literature, the stories that were told in, from time immemorial still deserve to be told because they have the same philosophical and theological uh, and personal significance that uh, moved those of our forebears and I think they move us still. Let me say one final thing before I, I leave you today and we'll pick it up next time. The, now the chorus enters and the chorus speaks in, it says you'll see on your page, strophe and antistrophe. The chorus who is down here in the orchestra are doing a sort of a dance. I told you they're probably wearing boots and they're, the chorus is they're probably shuffling, shuffling to one side. There's some sort of funky dance. Don't ask me to, I can't dance anyway. But they're, they're moving in one position. The strophe is a turn and then there's an antistrophe and then they go back the other way. So there's a, a sort of a performative ritual going on and the chorus represents the city. And they tend to represent the people and the people's estimation is pretty much that of the whole crowd here. The, the chorus represents the rest of us who are sitting watching the spectacle. And at the moment, the chorus loves Oedipus. They, he is their, he's a legendary figure in their midst. By the end of the play, the chorus is gonna turn and realize, but the chorus at this point is, is sort of like us, they're ignorant. But, he's, but it's not like the audience. I said the audience know the story of this, but the chorus here represents an ignorant populace, which they're not. So the actual audience that would be observing Oedipus the, the king knows all about the story. But these people who represent these people are the ignorant masses. They represent the ignorant masses that judge on the basis of appearances, but not on the basis of any real insight or wisdom. We haven't even met Tiresias yet, but we're going to see that Tiresias is sort of like a mirror image of, of, of Oedipus. He's a prophet, but he's blind. And he knows the truth. And, uh, quote a Trump, Tom Cruise movie, uh, Oedipus can't handle the truth. He does not want to know the truth. And Tiresias doesn't want to tell him the truth. And why does he not want to tell him the truth? Because if he tells him the truth, he's going to beat him for it. Because people don't, even though they say they want the truth, you don't want to know the truth. You do not want to know. And, and Tiresias, like a prophet of the Old Testament, bears a burden from possessing the truth because he knows what all he's going to get for this is a beating. He's not going to get a reward. He's going to get the hostility of the king because the king does not want to hear this. He's not going to believe it. He's going to attack him. So we'll see a true prophet meeting the false prophet of the play. And again, this is going to say something about people's desire even to hear the truth about themselves. And again, this is true of human nature, for that reason, a philosophical play, also true of, uh, as we know from the scriptures, true of how the prophets are treated in uh, biblical times. The prophets say things that nobody wants to hear. And you might want prophetic gifts, but be careful what you wish for, because <laughs> your life is not going to be pleasant. But that's still the way God operates. And same here. But I'll leave you off with that. I'll see you next time. Oh, I want to draw your attention. I'll just turn this.